ICE ND2, the other half, if you will. It's the same kind of navigation to get to the exam topics for ICE ND2, learningnetworkcisco.com, look for associate routing and switching, and then uh, look for the exam topics. So let me pick a few of those, or let me show you the ones I picked ahead of time. Um, briefly first, for those of you that have thought about the old exams and are still struggling with the old versus new exam uh, concept, there were some topics moved from the old exam ICND-1 into the new ICND-2. In particular, things like iOS files, uh, the iOS itself, uh, configuration files, how the boot process works, all that got uh, moved over to ICND-2. RIP went away completely, um, so Disinspector got moved over to ICND-2. And pretty much uh, as much WAN stuff as they could move got moved over to ICND-2 as well. So the configuration on serial links, which is a very small topic, got moved over. And a few totally new things, a little bit more on IPv6, a little bit more about WANs, three network management topics that you see there at the bottom of that graphic. And to me, um, very interesting topic to have at CCNA level, first top redundancy protocols. And we'll talk about that more in just a bit. That's traditionally been a uh, CCNP level topic. But again, we're focused on new. So cherry picking a few topics from within the ICND2 exam topics. The first section of exam topics happens to mention this one that's highlighted. Configure and verify per VLAN spanning tree protocol. So quick definition, this figure shows the same LAN but the spanning tree logic for VLAN 1 on the left and VLAN 2 on the right. Per VLAN, spanning tree protocol says, I can configure different settings per VLAN so that I end up with a different spanning tree topology for different VLANs as you see depicted in the red parts of the figure. What that lets you do is we have VLAN 1 traffic is going to use switch 3's left-hand link to go upward, and VLAN 2's traffic will use switch 3's right-hand link to go up in the figure. So it's a way to do poor man's load balancing, if you will, across a layer 2 switched environment. The configuration and verification of PVSTP, literally configure and verify, is, is actually pretty straightforward. Here's the tip. It's the concept behind it that you need to master. What is root? How do you pick root? What happens if the root priorities tie? What about port cost? How do you pick which ports are root ports and designated ports? That's the far more important um, issue. Typing the right command to set root or make a switch more likely to be root is not nearly as difficult. The reason I say that's important is when you get to the fourth of five sections of exam topics, there's a troubleshoot spanning tree protocol, and that's a, that's a fairly challenging exam topic to be ready for. So when, our, when you are studying spanning tree, don't just think about uh, what are the commands. Um, take the time to, to, to mull on uh, what are those rules. Next section down, IP routing. Well, there's already been a fair amount of IP routing both IPv4 and IPv6 back in ICND-1. Uh, so what you've really got in this IP routing technologies is a, a couple of things that are specific to platform, um, boot process and a Cisco router, iOS files and a Cisco router, uh, a little more on OSPF, and this new routing protocol enhanced IGRP. Um, it's another one. I'm not going to get into specifics on that one today. Just to say, you'll already have learned about OSPF. EIGRP can be very similar in how you configure it and very different in the show commands that you see with it. So if you're, if you're making uh, notes about uh, Wendell's tips, um, take extra time on show commands, particularly on uh, the things having to do with successor and feasible successor routes. It's, uh, it's just a different way to think about uh, how routing protocol works, far different from what you would have already read about OSPF. Now, the one that I, I find particularly interesting, as I mentioned before, first hop redundancy protocols, and this is a very interesting exam topic, not just because of the technology, but it's a rare use of the verb recognize. You may recall that a lot of the ones we talked about are configure and verify, or maybe troubleshoot. 
Let's recognize it. If you passed FHRP on the street, would you know who it is? That kind of thing. So what does it mean to recognize FHRP? Well, one thing it means is can you look at a network diagram and see if there's even an opportunity or a need for FHRP? Now, you may not even be familiar with the term FHRP, but you may be familiar with one of the three tools that fits in that category. FHRP is a type, and the individual protocols are HSRP, VRRP, and GLBP. And yes, there'll be a test later on that, but the uh, point is it's first hop redundancy, first hop meaning default gateway redundancy. In fact, it might be a better term to call it default gateway redundancy protocol. So think about hosts A, B, C, and D on the left. They have a setting in IP version 4, their default gateway or default router if you prefer. And in this drawing, all four of them have configured the dot one address, router R1, as their default gateway. Those four hosts, when they want to send a packet off subnet, they send it to router R1. But guess what? There are two routers connected to that subnet. Router R2 is also connected to the subnet, and that is the exact case two or more routers connected to a subnet in which an FHRP implementation makes sense. If you have more than one possible default gateway, let's have some way to make use of them. Here's the issue. As shown, if router R1 has a problem or router R1 serial link goes down, all those hosts, all they know to do is send stuff to R1 as the default gateway, and they can't take advantage of that redundant path through the WAN through R2. A first top redundancy protocol makes R1 and R2 communicate. The host point to an IP address that can move between R1 and R2. R1 goes away, all the traffic goes through R2. Or even better yet, some of the hosts send traffic through R1, some send it through R2, and if a failure occurs, all of it goes to the one that's still working. So back to the exam topic. Here's the advice. Be ready to look for designs that have multiple routers connected to the same LAN subnet. But you also need to be ready to recognize it in a config file, and you also need to be ready to recognize it in a show command. So if you happen to be using my books, for instance, it goes through a few examples of drawings, shows a few example config, shows some example show commands, but it's not to the level of you must know how to configure every last little parameter. It's more recognize when it's of use and when it's been configured. So very interesting topic. And again, it's been in CCNP uh, for quite a many, uh, long number of years. All right, next one, troubleshooting has a lot of troubleshoot topics. There's troubleshoot uh, and resolve spanning tree operation issues, for instance. Most of what's there says troubleshoot, but two of those say NetFlow, and I've highlighted one of those. NetFlow is a term. It's, it's a totally new topic to CCNA this time around. And so, again, an interesting addition. And I've heard a few comments online where people have been a little worried about that one, but oddly enough, of all the new stuff within the entire scope of CCNA routing and switching, this is the most likely exam topic for which if you didn't study for it, you, you'd be most likely to guess the right answer. And let me tell you why. Ignore the word NetFlow. The left-hand yellow box is a computer. The right-hand yellow box is a server. On the client computer on the left, the user opens a web browser and connects to a web server, opens an email client, uses POP3 to connect to an email server. IP packets flow, of course. So at a layer three perspective, you've got an IP packet with a source and destination IP address. From a TCP perspective, both applications use TCP. The client happened to use port numbers 1024 and 1025. The server used well-known port numbers 80 and 110 for those two apps. All that stuff that's covered in ICND1. If you remember the idea of source and destination IP addresses, source and destination port numbers, then you can probably read show commands that list NetFlow data and interpret what it means. All the NetFlow data shows is one direction of a TCP connection or one direction of a UDP flow, and it shows the source and destination addresses and ports and packet and byte counters so that you can see the types of flows from end users that are flowing in or out of an interface. 
So I, while it's an important topic, I think it's one of those things for which once you see it, say, oh, that's not bad at all. So don't let that one psych you out. And wrapping up here of the five sections in ICMD2, uh, the last section is WAN. And I've highlighted the one on configure and verify frame relay. Um, this time around, almost all the detail on WAN is in ICMD2. Um, frame relay is still there. Frame relay is on the downhill slide as far as its common use as an end to itself in real networks, but it's still commonly used as an access link, an access link to, say, an MPLS network, access link into a, um, an ISP. So it's still within scope, and of all the things you have to figure out how to configure and verify, uh, of all the things in those exam topics listed on the page right now, it's the one you'll have to invest the most time and to be ready for. Uh, so that's just a head up, heads up to know, yep, it's still there. You're still going to need to know it. Maybe it's not quite as detailed a requirement as it used to be. I've probably got less page count on frame relay uh, this time around as compared to last time. Um, but it's still there, uh, attainable. Uh, and for those of you that have are completely new to Frame Relay, never thought about it, uh, keep this in mind as a tip. It's a data link protocol, and it works a lot different than the <laughs> other data link protocol you see on Ethernet. So just be ready to think, you know, set aside what you know about data links and think a little differently when you get to Frame Relay.